then, um, and then we'll get started. And by the way, recording is in progress. Okay, looks good. It looks like everybody's in. Um, good evening again. We're very glad that you're joining us for the Kindergarten Readiness Forum to get information about preparing for kindergarten uh, and your family's options in New Orleans. Um, this event is sponsored by New Orleans Jewish Community Center and the Parenting Center at Children's Hospital in partnership um, and with, with much great gratitude uh, to our guests from New Orleans Public Schools to talk about the common application process. My name for those um, who are new to this group is Jenny Evans. I'm a parent educator with the Parenting Center and with the JCC, as well as a returning lead teacher at the JCC Nursery School. Tonight, my role is to facilitate. I'll introduce our speakers to you and I'll take your questions. So please put any questions or comments that you have in the chat. You can address them to everyone. You can address them to just me, however you choose. And we'll make sure that your questions get, um, get asked, your comments get shared. If by any crazy chance, there is anyone here who is unfamiliar with any of the Zoom features and you need help at this point, please wave wildly at your camera or click that little microphone and say, help me please. We mostly wanna be sure, as I said, that you can access the chat so that you can ask um, any questions. So everybody's okay. Tonight, you'll be hearing from Adrian Shulman, director of the JCC Nursery School and Pre-K, Patrice Wright, administrative manager and parent educator at the Parenting Center at Children's Hospital. And finally, Rebecca Latham, executive director of portfolio and Maggie Riddle, director of portfolio operations, both at New Orleans Public Schools, working with the common application process, formerly known as One App. What this means is that in addition to getting some really good information tonight, you're also learning a little bit more about resources in New Orleans, when you have questions about early childhood, parenting, and education. So let's get started. Adrian, let's start with the big picture. Can you tell us about the different options for families looking for kindergarten and what the steps might be to get information about applying? Yes, I can. Thank you, Jenny. So basically there's two types of, of options. And I have to say I'm admitting people while I'm doing this. So people are still coming on. Um, but there's two types of uh, school options. There's the public choice and there's the private choice. So the public choice I'm not gonna get into because you have two experts on board who will be talking about that process. Um, but I do wanna just mention uh, the private options. So there's a few different routes there. There's the Independent Schools Association, schools, the ISAS schools. Um, there's in New Orleans, I think there's nine, of those schools. Um, they are Newman, McGee, Trinity. There's a host of those schools. They're all within the same association and they all have their separate um, admissions policies. Um, but what basically they ask that you do it, well, let me, let me step back a moment. So there's the independent schools, which is um, a handful of schools that are in the same association. There's the archdiocese schools. Um, if you go to the, uh, the Catholic Archdiocese of New Orleans, you go to their website, there is a listing of all their local uh, schools. Um, and then we have individual private schools. So the New Orleans Jewish Community Day School would be one. The Waldorf School would be a private school. Um, so those are the options within the private realm. And again, the public, Rebecca and uh, Maggie are going to speak on that. Um, the procedure that you would want to do is really take a look at these websites, look at the websites, look at when their tours are, um, look at when their deadlines are. Um, it's really important, I think, to have in-person school tours if possible. I'm not sure that all schools are doing in-person this year. I know more are than did last year, but to really get a chance to um, if you can make it on campus to really get a feel for what the climate of the school is. Um, 
what um, is happening when you're there with the children and the teachers. Um, again, um, and then the enrollment process for each one um, of the private schools, typically there's some type of application. Sometimes that's right on their website and you can do it right there and set it in. Again, look at deadlines, that's very important. Um, often schools ask for, the private schools will ask for teacher recommendations. So they might send a teacher rec to your child's pre-K teacher or three-year-old class teacher. Um, and those teachers, you would have to um, give permission for those teachers to fill out a recommendation and send it back to that individual school. Often these uh, schools will do observations of the children in their, school, their current school setting. So they may come in, uh, meet with the teachers and observe the child in their current class. Um, some of the schools ask for developmental screenings. Uh, I know that Newman does that in-house. When you go visit the school, the child will also take a developmental screening. Some of the private schools ask that you have that done outside of the school and send it in. And lastly, some of them ask for play dates or visits to the school. So they may um, give you a call. At, you know, part of the application process is coming to visit the school and having your child spend an hour or two hours. Um, visiting with teachers and some of the other children in one of their classrooms. Um, so I wanna leave you with three things that are really important, I think, when you're looking at schools. One is um, if you can get a chance to go on campus, and I know COVID is a crazy time, um, but that I feel is really important. If not, make sure that you are available to um, participate in one of their online or virtual tours. Um, make sure you see deadlines, deadlines not only for the public schools, but for the private schools, uh, application deadlines, tour deadlines, those kind of things. And lastly, go with your gut feeling. You know, there's a lot of choices. I think there's a lot of good choices in New Orleans. Um, but really, if you're, if you're really thinking, how am I going to rate my choices? You know, there's five schools. Really think about what your gut is telling you. Um, and then lastly, I do want to say, you know, my child did not get his first choice of a charter school when we applied for kindergarten. And um, we ended up going to another school that wasn't our first choice. And we never looked back. So you may not get ultimately your very first choice. But I think most parents ultimately are happy with where their child uh, ends up. And then, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, if anybody has questions at this point, feel free to put them in the chat, but uh, Adrian's not going anywhere, so we can we can get her again. Um, but, so that's a lot to think about. It feels really different, the independent schools versus the private versus the, the public. And I know that um, one of the first thoughts that comes to parents' mind is wondering what their children need to know. Like, what are people looking for with these play dates and these evaluations? So what do their children need to know to be ready for these options? So Patrice, can you tell us about what it means to be ready for kindergarten? What should parents and teachers be focusing on? Sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Parenting Center, I'm excited to be here to share some kindergarten readiness skills with you. For one, we know children learn through play. That is imitation, exploration, and repetition with things and people. So parents play an important role in early learning of their children just by simply doing things with them. Now let's talk a little bit about what readiness means. When I think of readiness, I think of four individual areas. One would be academic. Academic readiness, what is that? And we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, social readiness, uh, independence and communication. So academic readiness has to do with you exposing your kids to language and books. So if you're already into a routine at night when it comes to reading books, this is building their academic readiness, calling their attention to pictures on the pages, talking to them about what the book involves, what are the pictures, Relating it to something that may be personal, meaning the activation of prior knowledge. If there is a bicycle in the book, you can simply say, oh my goodness, you have a bicycle as well. So building on language and development or developing language through the use of books. So that's an example of academics. 
Um, when it comes to social, their ability to just be able to follow rules. And when a rule is broken, is there a consequence? And are parents following through with the consequence? Sometimes as parents, and I'm one myself, it's hard to impose a consequence. But when you talk about social readiness, that's pretty much what it involves. And as parents, it's our responsibility to model positive expression of feelings. That is also one that falls under social readiness. So when a child is having a moment and there's a breakdown, being able to positively and calmly coach that child through that meltdown by identifying the feeling, I'm so sorry you're upset that we had to leave the playground, but it's okay, we'll be able to come back another day. So, so far we've covered academic, what, what you can be doing there, as well as social. Another one has to do with independence. How much are you allowing your child to do on their own? Are you the parent that's doing all things for him or her? If he is four and ready to enter kindergarten next year, he or she should be completely capable of putting on their own pajamas, maybe putting on their shoes, not necessarily tying them because that's a skill that will develop later on, but definitely being able to sit down. So are you mom and dad putting those shoes on for them? Are you putting those pajamas on them? Remember to be kindergarten ready. There is a level of independence that's necessary. And finally, the power of communication. Um, talking is teaching. So being able to talk to your child, sing to your child, read to your child, communicate them about what's going on as you're transitioning from one location to the next, as you're picking them up from grandma's house. What are you seeing? Are you calling their attention to a stop sign? Are you talking to them about what they've done with grandma during that during the day? Are you encouraging them when someone is talking to them to talk back and not allow them to stand and just kind of look, you know? It doesn't have to be a force of them to speak to the person, but a, a little slight encouragement for them to speak and communicate. So again, that's a lot of information in a little time. We have so much to cover tonight. But when I think of kindergarten readiness, I think of academics, I think of social independence, as well as communication. If you're doing these things at home now, you can not only prepare your kids to be kindergarten ready, you can also prepare them to be successful. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That sounds much more manageable. Every time Patrice says it, I think, oh yeah, we, that, as a teacher now, a parent of grown people, that sounds quite manageable. So one thing before we move on though, I, that I, re, I was reminded because I know Patrice has often said, um, one of the things about the communication skills is that that's what your kids are gonna need for all these, these sort of these odd visits, right? Whether they're visiting with a psychologist for a test or visiting a school um, for a play date. Um, so either Patrice or Adrian or both, what are the other things that a parent might do to sort of prepare for that day, you know, if their child is going to go to visit a school or go visit a psychologist, what should parents be doing to prepare them? Well, one thing you want to do is um, set them up for success. <laughs> so if you have that visit the next day, it might not be a good idea to have the, the big party the night before, make sure they get, you know, a good breakfast, make sure they um, sleep as well as they can, um, and really just um, have just a typical day before, a typical morning. Um, I think that's really important in um, making sure that they can be as successful as, as possible. Patrice, do you have anything else to add? Yes, I totally agree with you, but sometimes you just can't predict what's going to happen. I think things need to happen organically and naturally. If you are communicating with your child on a regular basis, whether that is through communicating just by conversation, if you're talking about a book, reading, singing, doing nursery rhymes, all of those things are going to be beneficial for that, um, that visit. So when someone asks them a question, are they prepared to answer? So that can be one thing you're starting to do. Just simply say, oh my goodness, how was your day today? And if they say fine, just push a little bit, have them elaborate a little bit more by saying, 
what made it fine? What did you do today? Actually, what did you eat today? Because in our little people's brains, they can't give you a scope of what their entire day is like. But what they can tell you is what they ate for lunch and it was really good or how much fun they had playing with Miss Adrian at recess time. So just taking the entire day and breaking it down into small chunks and having them be able to talk to you, I think will make the visit um, really good because you don't want to try to predict it or script it out because that's not going to be too good. Okay, cool. That's very helpful. Um, and again, parents, if you put any questions in the, in the chat, I'll definitely voice those for you. So moving on to Rebecca and Maggie. The common application, most of us have known as one app, got to keep saying that can be overwhelming, but it's the gateway to a lot of different choices with several steps and deadlines and, and exceptions here for this school and for that one. So we're excited for you to tell parents more about that process, where we are now in the timeline and what happens next. Hey, good evening, everyone. I am Rebecca Latham, um, Executive Director of Portfolio at NOAA Public Schools. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen while Maggie introduces herself. Hi everyone, I'm Maggie Rupert-Dell. I'm the Director of uh, Portfolio Operations at NOLA Public Schools and work closely with Rebecca on all of our enrollment systems. All right, I think, can y'all just give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen here, Jen here, awesome. Um, all right, well, we'll go ahead and jump in. Again, I'm Rebecca Latham, Maggie Rudell is here with me. Um, certainly, if y'all have questions after this presentation, you're welcome to reach out to us. Um, Jenny knows how to get in touch with us as well. Um, we also have an email address dedicated to families. Um, that's enroll at nolapublicschools.com. Um, this email address is manned by a team of folks. Um, so you can always, if nothing else, send, send your questions there. In addition to an option to email any questions that you have, we also have three family resource centers and the locations of those are listed here. We have one at the NOLA Public School Central Office located on the West Bank. We also have one out in New Orleans East. It's located at IDEA Oscar Dunn School. And then we have a location at Mahalia Jackson School and that is in Uptown. Um, this is for in-person help, support services, anything you need, you can just drop in, um, you just walk in, sign in, and as soon as someone's available to help, um, they can help you with whatever you need at our family resource centers. So I think I went one slide too far here. Here we go. Um, so this is just sort of a quick agenda of what we're looking at covering tonight. Um, we're gonna start with the NCAP, which is the NOLA Public Schools Common Application Process. Many of you know that by the one app. Um, it just recently went through a name change. Um, so we're working on sort of communicating that out into the community. So we're gonna just do a high level overview of that process. Um, and then we'll actually get into very specific details for you all with that. We're gonna share key dates. Um, can stress in the same way uh, Adrian did before me, deadlines, 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 <laughs> know what those are. Um, they are important, they are significant and they do matter. Um, so we'll share some key dates um, for you with the application deadline, but also how our enrollment phases work and the deadlines uh, for those as we look at that cycle throughout the system. Uh, we'll get into the details or specifics with the application process and then um, end just with contact information and other supports available for families. So here's a big sort of level overview of our common application process. Um, it is designed for families to have one place to apply for school um, throughout the entire city. And so that's why we call it the common application. Um, it does include 76 New Orleans public schools within the application that you could apply for and rank. We also encompass our six type two charter schools, which are authorized by BSEE or the state, not by NOLA public schools, but they do participate in our common application process as well. All of our scholarship funded seats in private schools are in our common application process. Um, and then our publicly funded early childhood programs um, fall under this common application as well. And so we work with families who have infants 
all the way to students in grade 12. And this is the one central place that those families can come to apply for publicly funded seats in, in New Orleans. This is just a screenshot of um, sort of like the quick and easy steps to our application process. Um, our application process starts by families creating a family profile. Again, we'll go into very uh, big detail into this later in the slides. Um, once you create the family profile, you're actually inside of the application and it'll walk you through the steps of ranking your preferred schools for each child that you have on your application. Um, once you've ranked those schools, you'll submit the application and those applications are due by January 21st. And once that happens, then there's a period in which NOLA Public Schools um, needs to do some things before we run what we call the match. And the match is taking into account all of the rankings from all of the applications, um, running it through an algorithm that also takes into account some other things that we'll get into in detail. Um, but then that matches up students with their preferred rankings. And those match results are uh, scheduled to be released the last week in March. This is um, just sort of kind of a high level view of our assignment process. So NOLA PS runs the match process, which again is to assign students to schools. To do this, we use the rankings that families make on the preferences submitted in the application. Um, Jenny had mentioned this a little earlier. We do have some schools in, in the system that have additional eligibility requirements. And so when families rank those schools, they also have to meet the eligibility requirements for those schools. And so we have to take into account whether or not students are eligible for the rankings that they put. Um, and then our schools create what we call targets or essentially what the school's capacity is by grade level. And so we need to know that from the schools in order to understand how many available seats the school has before we run the match. Um, when the match happens, all of the students are assigned a random lottery number. These numbers are what we use to make the student assignments. And then those lottery numbers also kind of put your, uh, your place in line on any of the schools in, that have wait lists. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that later too. Um, the, so then the match process assigns the seat for each student. It assigns it to your highest ranked school for which there's an available seat. Again, taking into account all the preferences from the students who submitted an application. We also have some priorities within the system. Um, we try to unify siblings where we can, and there's some geographic priorities. Some of you may have uh, may be familiar with our under half mile geographic priority. So if you live less than a half mile from a school, you have a priority in the match to be matched to a school that's less than a half mile from your home. Um, and then again, we have to look at what the school's capacity is. Um, and so the schools will give us that information prior to running the match. Um, I'm not gonna play this video just in the interest of time, um, but we do have explainer videos on our website. This particular one I used as a placeholder here. Um, explains in much more detail through pictures how the match works. Um, so if you really want that like uh, more explanation, but also with the graphics, um, I would highly suggest going to the enrollnolaps.com website. And we're gonna get into screenshots more about that website in a minute. Um, but we do have a bank of uh, explainer videos. Um, and there is one that specifically just talks about how the common application and the match part of this works. Um, so just know that those videos are available. I would second that, big fan. Yeah, yep, that, that one, that particular one, um, it is this, it's the same, we haven't, uh, we, we kind of dubbed over the one app language to get the end cap, but the way the match works hasn't changed. Um, and then the other videos on the site, we, re, we actually reshot them. Um, so, but you'll, you'll notice some things familiar about that one, <laughs> about that one. Um, so this just gets into really some of the NCAP priority types. Um, I touched on a few of them, um, 
But here you can see we've linked to the um, Orleans Parish Board policy and we will get a copy of this slide deck to you, Jenny, um, to feel free to share out as you need to so that these, these links are active and live for folks. Um, but our board policy has uh, some of the priorities listed in them. And so you can see here that we have full priority, which applies to 100% of available seats. We also have things that are called partial priorities, which will apply to less than 100% of the available seats. Um, then we have specific priorities. Again, the geographic priority, that's less than a half mile, but it's what we call partial priority. So what that means is if you're applying for a kindergarten classroom and there are 25 available seats in the classroom, this priority only applies to a certain percentage of those seats. It doesn't apply to all of them. So all 26 of them can't be taken by students that are less than a half mile from that school. Only a certain number of them will have that priority. Um, sibling priority is a full priority. What that means um, for most schools, um, there are some exceptions to these um, for, first, for what we call our joining schools. So Lusher for the first time is going to be in the common application process. Um, and I can talk more specifically about how that works for Lusher. Um, in addition, Lake Forest is um, joining the common application process for this cycle. Um, they have academic requirements similar to Lusher. And then Ben Franklin High School will be in our common application for the first time. These actually are the last three schools in the city, <laughs> which unified our system. Um, so really excited, really excited for that. Um, but there are some different, uh, some different sibling priorities uh, for those schools as they are sort of outlined in their operating agreement and grandfathered in for, for the common application process. But what this means is that we really try to do our best to unify siblings. And so we have a full priority to siblings trying to get into the same school um, as a sibling who's already there. Um, I think that's the key. <laughs> Keeping two of them together, we have a family link. We keep them together and try to put them at the highest ranked school they have in common. But if one sibling is attending a school and the other one is trying to what we call unify with that sibling in the following school year, that's a full priority in our system for most of the schools. The only time that doesn't apply is when a sibling is in what we call a terminal grade. And a terminal grade just means that's the last grade in the school that the child can attend before they have to go to a different school. Um, mostly we're talking about eighth graders going to ninth grade. So if I was in eighth grade and had a younger sibling wanted to unify with me at my school, <laughs> but I'm in a terminal grade, I wouldn't be at that school next year. And so unifying the sibling wouldn't apply for this priority in a terminal grade. And then the other uh, full priority we have is what we call closing school priority. Um, so in years in which schools are not renewed um, and not taken over by another operator, the students in those schools get what we call closing school priority. What that means is that their school is no longer going to be operated by anyone in the next school year and they're forced to find a seat somewhere else in, in another school in the city. Um, and so they get full priority to what they have ranked as long as their seat's available. Um, and that priority, again, it's not given to eighth graders who would have to have chosen anyway had the school remained open. Um, so in that terminal transition grade, the priority doesn't apply because the child would have had to participate in the common application and choose another school regardless of the closure. Um, but in grades in which um, we're closing a school and they could have stayed, they get full priority to, to their ranked choices. And so those are all taken into account when we run the match. Denny, I don't know if there's, if you're getting questions, if I should sort of stop and slow down. Um, we're doing okay. We yeah, Maggie's been answering them. We're doing okay. I, I don't know whether you want to answer this one now. I think the one thing that people could use some help on is maybe an example of the type one, type two, type three, um, so that they understand. I, my understanding is that those six type two schools are under the authority of the state. Is that like NOCA? Are they in the one app now? So NOCA is not. NOCA is the only school in which they are not in the one app and they're actually authorized by, they're not, 
authorized by BASI. I think they're authorized by the state legislation. Um, but NOCA is the only school inside of Orleans Parish that is not in the one app. The six um, BESI authorized schools, those are like um, Lycee Francais is a BESI authorized school. Um, what that means is that they're just not authorized by Orleans Parish. And so they participate in the unified enrollment, but they're not held accountable to us and we don't hold them accountable for, for things outside of enrollment. The state holds them accountable. Um, NOMA, the New Orleans uh, Military Academy, they're one of our uh, BESI schools. Maggie, feel free to jump in as I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, um, Inter International High School, International School of Louisiana, um, Noble Minds, I think you named the other one, Lycée Francais, um, New Harmony High, and um, I think that's it. Yeah, and I would yeah. say like the Cowan Institute, every year they produce uh, a governance chart of NOLA public schools. Um, and so if you go to their site, you can pull up the 2021 governance chart. It'll have all 76 listed that are under our authorization. It'll have the six BESI ones listed. It also has NOCA listed. Um, but in addition to that, in the bottom of those charts, the Cowan Institute, they always put what the changes were from the previous year. And so that's really helpful as the governance charts change to understand what schools were not renewed, what schools were closed, what schools changed operators. Um, and so they do a really nice job putting together that chart that they make available on their site. I just dropped the link for that chart into the chat. So if folks can open that up and take a look. Um, it's, it's well laid out visually too, which is helpful. Um, Rebecca, there's two questions that have been dropped in here specific to kindergarten. First is the age requirement and birthday cutoffs for kindergarten. Um, and the second is if you can speak to any of the admissions about the pre-K gifted programs like at Heinz and what, if any additional steps families need to take for those schools. Yeah, so I think the first question, um, sorry, the admit from the waiting room popped up on my screen. Um, so the first question you asked, what was the first question again, Maggie? What the age cutoff is and requirement. Yeah. yeah, so the state just passed a law that requires any students who turn five by September 30th to attend kindergarten. Um, and so September 30th is the birthday cutoff. If you will be five by September 30th, you must attend kindergarten. Um, and if you're not yet five by September 30th, you would be in pre-K four. Adrienne, did you wanna add something there? Yeah, well, I wanna clarify. So if a, a parent, um, say a parent at my school has a pre k or this year, but wants to do pre-K again next year, and then the year of kindergarten, they would be six by September 30th. Can they enroll in kindergarten in a charter school? So not for the 22, 23 year, but for the following year, they'll be six by September 30th. Yeah, so I, I think a couple of things. One, um, if, if they're at a NOLA public school in pre-K four, they would not repeat pre-K four based on their age and their birth date. Um, if they're not at a NOLA public school for pre-K four, but they want to go to pre-K four at a NOLA public school, they can't turn five before September 30th to go into pre-K. But, but so for kindergarten though, if they choose to keep their child in a private pre-K um, and for an if additional If they turn year, five before September 30th, they would have to go into kindergarten when they move to Enola Public School. Okay. So what if they turn a, six? What if they turn six? Can they still start at kindergarten? Yeah, I, I think the way the law reads right now is up to the age of seven, they can start yeah. at kindergarten. What I don't know is as we see this five-year-old requirement, which never existed before, play itself out over the next two years, I would imagine this there could be some adjustment in the six or seven when you start kindergarten. But I, I believe currently the law says you can be up to seven and come into kindergarten. Um, and again, like this will be the first year that there's been this requirement for kids who turn five by September 30th to attend kindergarten. So I'm not sure if that age will adjust as, as we know more kids are gonna be in kindergarten by the age of five. 
Um, Rebecca, ne next question um, here is if you can speak a little bit about the admission process for pre-K gifted programs. Yep. So the so to to be eligible, so there's a couple things that happen in the unified enrollment system. Um, and when I say a couple of things, it's conditions that have to be met. Um, so to be included within the match, if you're looking at a pre-K program, you have to fill out our NCAP. Um, that's, that's one thing that has to happen. If any program, including a pre-K for a gifted program, has additional eligibility requirements, you have to meet those eligibility requirements. So if you're looking for the gifted program, you have to have gone through an evaluation and had been determined to be gifted or meet the gifted criteria as it's outlined by the state. And then the other thing you would have to do, if you're looking at a pre-K-4 program, you have to get what we call verified for early childhood. Um, and so there's a process in which you have to turn in specific documents to be verified for early childhood. That includes your birth certificate to verify the age. It includes a parent's driver's license. The name on that has to match one of the biological parents on the birth certificate. It includes income documents to see which types of seats you're eligible for. We have publicly funded pre-K-4 seats. We have tuition-based pre-K-4 seats. Um, and so you would have to go through what we call early childhood verification process. And you need to do that before the match happens Otherwise you're not included in the match. And so again, common application, you have to meet the program's eligibility requirements. In this case, you would have to have an evaluation um, and be uh, qualified as being gifted. And then you would have to complete the early childhood verification process if you're looking at pre-K four for all of the rankings in your thing to be honored in the match. Yeah, just to give a little bit of clarification on the timeline here. So some, some families know that they wanna to go to a school that has a additional eligibility criteria. And so they go ahead and start doing whatever testing is gonna be required for that student ahead of the deadline of January 21st. But we have to design our system so that if someone submits their application on the very last day, you turn it in on, on January 21st and you listed schools that have eligibility criteria, we have to give you time to take that test so that we give you a fair shot at that seat. And so the timeline here is a little bit fuzzy because there's not like a drop dead date that's the same every year. But if you are need to do gifted evaluation, you could probably do it like in late January, maybe early February, but like really the earlier you need, you can do it. Yeah, I'm to. shaking my head no on that, Maggie, because you can't get a gifted evaluation done that fast. Um, yeah, no, you want to start and schedule your assessments as soon as possible. I think to speak to what Maggie's saying is you may decide not to fill out your application till the due date, which is January 21st. What we have um, let programs that have additional academic requirements no, is there has to be at least one assessment opportunity after January 21st. Um, that could be a week after January 21st. Um, but at some point, right, we can't extend too far past January 1st with these assessment dates because we have to run the match so that we can let families know where the students are, are assigned for school the following year. Um, and so, so can, you can turn your application in January 21st and you should be offered an assessment date after January 21st if you're trying to get into schools with language requirements, schools with academic requirements. A gifted evaluation is different. Um, the gifted evaluations are not show up on a Saturday, you get tested and those are completed. Those take much longer than that. And those are the ones you really, if you're thinking of a gifted program, you need to initiate that process now. Um, so, and I don't, I don't wanna be the total Grinch of this, but one of the, the reasons that um, 
Adrian and Patrice and I got real firm about this being the kindergarten readiness thing <laughs> is because the pre-K <laughs> program really is a whole other, I see Rebecca nodding, it's a real whole other thing. But correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, I think this is what they're really good at at those family resource centers. Um, you know, it's kind of guiding people through which one of these options are good. So I don't want to cut off the information on the gifted thing. I just wanted to remind us that we're not going to be able to solve the whole pre-K thing as well as the kindergarten thing. And I do want to get through the rest of the, the one app process. Um, but one thing, Rebecca, that somebody asked that goes with what you were saying is if you get your um, gifted evaluation, if you start getting that done or you get that done, how long is that good? So what if your three-year-old gets a gifted eval? Is that going to hold through when you're applying as a four-year-old to a pre-K program? Yeah, so evaluations are good for three years. And so okay, if you three do years. it when you're three, it should hold through to the four-year-old program. Yep, they're good for three years. And then lastly, where should just just where should somebody start? If they don't know what you're talking about with gifted evals, where should where should that parent start? Yep, you could go to one of the family resource centers, you could send an email to enroll at nolapublicschools.com, and that'll get routed to someone who can answer that question for you. And, and you can go to private psychologists and pay, right? Or is yep, that no you can go. Yeah, no, you can go to private psychologists. Um, actually, a lot of the private schools that require you to have some sort of academic testing or IQ testing, they will have a list of psychologists they'll give you an option of 15 or 20 across the city. Um, and if you go the private route, you're probably going to call half the ones on the list <laughs> so that you can get a date that works with the timeline for the deadlines of these applications. Yeah. And um, Patrice and Adrian have lists of those. Um, I should say the Parenting Center and the JCC Nursery School have lists of those private folks as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Can yeah. I, and if I, you want to go through the public system, you can go to nolapublicschools.com and our Exceptional Children's Services page, and you can request the eval that way. Um, and they'll do a screening first. If the child passes the screening, they'll move you to a full evaluation. Um, but that could take, I mean, it could take up to 90 days um, in the public system. Private, you would have to ask them. I, I wanna make sure we answer this question too. Someone asked about are there additional resources, um, uh, talking about the individual public schools. And um, I know we spoke before folks got on that NOLA Public Schools directory is on your website, right? Yep. So I went and we have today. screenshots for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I clicked on that and I got some information. And then Rebecca, you also said that the Department of Ed has a good resource there too? Yep, okay. we have a slide in here for that as well. Oh, perfect, thank yep. you. Okay, and then do any of, sorry, and then do any of the, um, Kindergartens require a gifted gifted evaluation, or is that just something you do to get an IEP? Yeah, that would just be something you do to get an IEP. We do have gifted um, school gifted not gifted. We do have kindergartens that require additional eligibility requirements, which are assessments that the school administers themselves, which apply to Lusher and Lake Forest for kindergarten. So, if you're interested in Lusher or Lake Forest, in addition to doing the common application you will also take an assessment that is administered by those schools at their schools, and you'll register for those tests with the school. And to get the instructions and information to do that, you get an email after you complete the common application. And it says, you've ranked a school with additional academic criteria. Here is a link to how you sign up to take the tests with that school. But that's different than gifted. It's just additional academic requirements or or language requirements. We have schools with language requirements as well. Ready for me to move on, Jenny, in the slide? <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is like, should you complete the NCAP? Um, so if students are currently enrolled in, num in a NOLA public school in a terminal grade, and you need to choose a new school, you need to fill out the application. Um, and then the next one is, is if your student wants to switch schools for the next year, you would fill out the application during the main round and you could try to get a new school for the following school year. If you're new to Orleans Parish and you're starting school in the fall, you should fill out an application. Um, if you're coming from a private pre-K program and you're looking for a kindergarten seat and you've never been in a NOLA public school before, you would fill out the application. 
Um, and then if anybody is seeking to transfer publicly funded seats, um, we would also fill out applications for that as well. Um, you should not complete the application if you're happy with your current school and it offers a seat for you for next year. We do have some um, schools in our system that have pre-K-4 programs and those pre-K-4 seats do not matriculate to kindergarten. Um, and so there are, there are um, Lise is the one that, that comes to the top of mind for me. Their pre-K-4 students do not automatically go to kindergarten. And so if you were a pre-K-4 student there, you would need to fill out the application. Um, the best way to check that is if you're in a public school and you're in a pre-K-4 seat, just ask, do I need to fill out the application to stay in kindergarten here? Um, there are very few schools that don't do that, but there are some. Um, and then your student needs to be placed in a school for the current school year. Don't fill out an application. <laughs> the application, the common application is for next school year. So if you need a seat right now, um, you would go to a family resource center to get an immediate placement there. Um, so this is just a slide we have dedicated to a little bit more information about our additional eligibility criteria schools in the in the common application process. Um, if if we call them, sometimes we call them academic requirement schools, language requirement schools, or we may say they have additional eligibility criteria. Um, what this means is that in addition to the common application, there are additional actions that families need to take to meet the eligibility criteria for these schools. And if you don't meet the eligibility criteria before the match, then in the algorithm, it'll skip over that school in your rankings. So you do need to fill out the application and you need to meet the eligibility criteria for that choice to be considered in our algorithm in the match process. And some of the additional criteria, again, talked about this, but there could be academic testing. Um, most of the schools have a minimum GPA requirement. If it applies, it doesn't really apply if you're looking in the kindergarten because they don't have GPAs yet. Um, there could be a language assessment for our language immersion programs. Um, in addition to the assessment, some of the schools also require you to attend an open house. A lot of those, um, as mentioned earlier, have gone virtual. Um, as part of the common application process, you have to have the ability to be able to do all of these things if you fill out your application on January 21st. So some of these open houses, if they've occurred already, they'll be recorded and you'll be, you'll have to watch the recording to meet that open house requirement. Um, so if you've missed an open house, it doesn't mean that you can't, a lot of schools use a matrix where they take into account different things and they give points. Attending the open house accounts for some of those points. Um, but again, the unified enrollment system, even if you turn an application in on January 21st, you still get all the same opportunities to meet all the points on a matrix. You'll be offered a testing session. Um, and if there's an open house requirement and that's already happened, there would be a video that you would be required to watch to meet that requirement for the school. Um, I think, you know, if you know that you're interested in a school with additional requirements, the earlier you complete the application and start those processes, um, the more flexibility you'll have in scheduling whatever the additional requirements or assessments are. So I would encourage you to fill out the applications so that you have some more flexibility and choice and your opportunities to complete um, assessments or other requirements they may have. And then when you complete the common application that includes the school with eligibility requirements, you'll receive an email that gives you the directions on the next steps that need to be taken with those schools. Um, and then these next steps, again, completed prior to the NCAP deadline or very soon afterwards. Um, I, the one thing that all the schools will do is give every family the opportunity to meet their eligibility requirements as long as your application was completed before January 21st. So again, deadlines, know what they are. Um, they are important and significant. <laughs> But there's one question in here before you move on. Is there a way to make sure you have met the eligibility criteria through one app prior to the match date? Um, yeah, so the schools in which require the additional eligibility criteria will inform you of whether or not you met that criteria. 
Um, I know, for example, uh, Lake Forest and, and Lusher have a, they have a GPA requirement. If you don't meet the GPA requirement, they let you know up front and you don't sit for the assessment. When you sit for the assessment, um, they'll let you know if you met the eligibility requirements. Um, but the best place to get that information and inquire about it is with the school itself. Um, on our end, after the assessments are completed with the schools, whether it's language or academic, the schools let us know if the students met the minimum eligibility requirements. If they are, there's a feature we turn on in our system that then makes sure that the child is included in the match. Um, Can but I this Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can I just clarify? I'm curious. You said GPA requirement for Lusher and Lake Forest. You're not talking about entrance to kindergarten, right? That's okay. I just want to yep. clarify so people aren't worried about getting GPAs. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. same with the same with the language, right, Rebecca? That's something if you're entering a language immersion school after kindergarten, they'll be okay. Yep. Yeah. I think of most significance maybe to, to this group of folks and, and if you're child is going into kindergarten and you have an older sibling um, and you're trying to unify at a school, I would just inquire with the school in terms of what type of priority they have for sibling unification. Um, because I know um, like Lusher has, has different, uh, it's not like if your sibling is in any of the Lusher buildings, you get the unification priority. Um, they have some special things around you know, what grade the sibling needs to be in or how long the sibling needed to have been at Lusher. Um, and so the best place to inquire about a sibling priority if you're trying to get into kindergarten and have an older sibling is to ask the school, school what their priority is for sibling unification. Um, so this next slide just sort of like tease up the next bit of slides we're gonna go through. Um, we have some slides that we're gonna share from enrolldolaps.com which is our enrollment sort of website hub. Um, located in the enrollnolaps.com site is a school finder tool. Um, we recently redid the website and we redid this school finder tool for families. Um, and so that will cover. And then we also have the application itself, which is on the parent portal. Um, and then again, if families have questions, you can always send those to enroll at nolapublicschools.com. Um, can I just answer, I know Danielle just asked again about um, the age requirement. It sounds like, just to clarify yet again, that by law, children can enter kindergarten at age six if they turn six or seven by September 30th. So you can do two years at, at JCC pre-K if you choose, and your child can then be six when they enter kindergarten. Okay, thank you. So this is our key dates along with sort of what does the enrollment cycles look like at NOLA Public Schools. Um, we're currently in what we call main round enrollment that opened on November 1st. Um, that opens with the common application. Um, that application will close on November 21st. And so that's our main round deadline. Um, notification of placement or what we call our match results um, will go to families by March 31st. That's when you find out of the schools you ranked, did you get your first choice? Did you get your second choice? Did you get your third choice? Um, if you're unhappy with your assignment from that, you can participate in round two. Um, it runs like the main round, um, except it's just a round two. And so that starts in April or May. You complete the application, you rank your schools on there, there's another match process and you're matched to whatever seats are available during round two. After round two ends, we go through what we call a system flip. After the system flip, we open the system back up in July with what we call summer enrollment. Um, here you can see seat, seat availability. If there's a seat available at a school you'd rather have than the one where you're assigned, or if you didn't take an assignment and you're looking for a seat, um, you can see our seat availability. You can uh, then take a seat from one of the seats that are available and you can do that through the Family Resource Center. Um, when summer enrollment ends, um, we have what we call our fall transfer period. Um, fall transfer starts the third Monday in August. The way fall transfer works is that at this point you have a school assignment, you're attending the school, 
maybe you were new to the school and in the first couple of weeks you're like this just isn't the right fit for my child you can talk to the school and say hey we're really interested in picking something else um, and this is what we call fall transfer because you have you have some sort of a small conference or discussion with the school um, and then the school says okay you know can we fix it can we not fix it sorry this didn't work out yes please go to a family resource center you can pick a new school you're allowed to do that up until October 1st. And then on October 1st, um, the only way to change schools if you're in a New Orleans public school at that point is through what we call our hardship transfer process. Um, and here a family would demonstrate a hardship. Um, it could be that you moved um, and now you're a lot further away from the school that you thought your child was gonna go to kindergarten to. Um, it could be that you change jobs and your commute is different or the time you start work is different or the time you end. And so now you need to pick a different school. Um, there are various reasons uh, why a family might need to pick a different school after they already have one. Um, and so you have the ability to do that. Again, we just make the school and the parent um, work together to submit that form. And then you just work with the Family Resource Center on where are the available seats and what works best for your family to alleviate whatever hardship you have at the time that you need to make a move from schools. Um, but that's essentially how the enrollment cycle works. Um, and then the beginning of November, our main round will open again for the applications to, to be filled out to try to match um, the following school year. Can I ask a question? Uh, you were just mentioning getting to school or moving further away from your school. Do you, I don't know if you can speak on um, busing. Um, is there a requirement now that the New Orleans public schools need to provide busing? Um, or is that not? Yep, so that's that's a really good question, Adrian. I, I think the response to this falls into to three, maybe three buckets. One is there are some schools that have in their operating agreements clauses that were grandfathered in in which they don't provide transportation to school. Um, if you're not in that, then you're required to provide transportation to school, but we don't necessarily say that has to be a bus. Um, so we do have schools within the system who may provide um, bus transportation through the city busing system. Um, and then of course, obviously the common way to provide the transportation is through a yellow bus. Um, so there are some operating agreements that have been around for a long time in which schools may not be providing transportation. All other schools need to provide transportation, but we don't say how that has to happen. Any other questions? Questions want me to keep going. <laughs> I'm also conscious. I think of you're. Time. I think you're going to say this. I think you're going to cover this. Yeah, but um, there was a simple question. When you do complete the application on the website, then um, just to clarify, you get an email that says your next step is to go to the Family Resource Center with all these documents. Yes, you okay. actually. Yep. If you and that's this is only if you're verifying for early childhood, not for kindergarten. So if we're looking at kindergarten, you don't have to bring a bunch of documents to the Family Resource Center. If you're looking at anything from infant to pre-K four, that's considered early childhood and you do a document verification for that. But if for kindergarten, you're not gonna have to bring a bunch of documents to a Family Resource Center. Once you get your match placement, you'll be asked to register at the school in which your child got matched to. And that's when you bring your residency documents directly to the school to register. And that'll happen after the match. So again, Jenny, I would just want to be conscious of folks' time. I'm yeah. happy to stick around if that's what that what folks want to do. Um, the next set of slides are our application process. They're screenshots taken directly from the enrollnolps.com site um, and screenshots directly to show you what our application looks like and the pieces that you fill out. Okay, well, why don't we just say um, we've we've hit our hour point, so we're officially um, letting you off the hook if you're ready to go. <laughs> um, if you have any questions for the panelists, then uh, you can put them in the chat or you can call us tomorrow and I will make sure you get answers from those panelists. 
And if you wanna see some quick pictures of the application process, then feel free to hang around for what? 10 more minutes, Rebecca? Sure. Yeah, I can okay. go through these pretty quick. Again, they're screenshots directly from our sites. Okay, and then we will have the information for those of you who have quite had it at eight o'clock on a school night. We will have the video of this session on, including the little 10 minutes we're about to do, on the Parenting Center's Facebook page. And you can contact us, or many of you have the Adrian at NOJCC um, email address, and we can send you the slides. So um, here's our official end of the hour good night. And um, Jenny, just real quick, I'm so sorry. I know there's a lot of JCC parents on. I'm going to go ahead and send the um, the recording out to everyone. Um, oh, okay, tomorrow. and Adrian will send it to you. Um, yeah, so thank you to everyone who's leaving. And go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> All right, I'll go through these a little faster. So here we have the screenshots. This is the websites where you can access the screenshots we're about to show. Um, this is our enrollnolaps.com landing page. This is the enroll tab. Um, and this is the apply now where you get to the common application. And then if you need a seat today, you would go to a family resource center or if you're early childhood, you would click this button. Um, this is again, just a screenshot to show you that we have a video library on the enroll tab. Um, and so you can see how the common application works that talks about how our match works and it's in three languages. This is our family support tab. So if we click here, this is the view we see, um, just talks about our family resource centers, where they're located, map, show you how to get there. Um, on our family support tab, we also have some more explainer videos. Um, to complete the application, you do need an email account. So we walk folks how to create that if anyone doesn't have an email, how to create the portal credentials, how to complete an EC common application, and then how to complete your K-12 common application. Um, so definitely you would want to uh, look at how to create the portal credentials if you already have an email, and then you want to complete the K-12 common app. Um, those are really helpful videos. We just re-recorded those and we should hopefully have the new ones up in the next day. Um, same content, just uh, studio editing on the new, new ones that'll pop up. This is our Explore Schools page. Um, this is finding an early childhood program and then we have uh, find a K-12 program. If you click this Explore K-12 Schools, it'll take you to what we call our School Finder tool. We have screenshots of that. Um, and then the second piece of this is we're still building out our school finder. It's uh, This is new to us this year. And so there's opportunities for families to give feedback to improve uh, exploring the schools. If you explore the schools, this is the page that it'll take you to in the school finder tool. The schools are listed over on the side. They do include our early childhood programs, which is why the number you see here is so large. Um, we service more early childhood programs than schools. <laughs> And then these give the locations uh, to the schools. And so there's a map of the city because we know that um, geographic proximity to, to home and work um, is, is important when looking for a school. Um, here, if you click this filter uh, tab at the top, this side pane window shows up and this gives you your filter options. Um, so if you are, you know, Maybe you're trying to get three siblings in and they're on different grade levels. You could filter to make sure you get a school that services all of those grade levels. Um, then we have uh, transportation services mentioned earlier, ADA compliant facilities, Head Start Early Childhood programs, um, school grade. Um, I think an important thing to understand about our school grades is that given COVID, um, the data in for school grades are from a pre-COVID time of the statewide assessments and school performance scores. Um, the state will be very soon releasing um, a scores from this past year, um, obviously with some caveats of, of the COVID interruption to education, um, but you are able to filter by the school grades as well. And then this is the view you get when you uh, click the keyword and you can punch in keywords or addresses up here if you wanna see um, and filter that way. Maggie, jump in if there's anything that you're like, oh, I need to highlight that quick. <laughs> um, again, that was our Explore Schools tab um, and you, the Explore Schools is actually the same whether you hit here or here. 
um, it's the same tool. And we're um, constantly uh, trying to decide what additional filters to add to that as well. So it, you'll see it um, keep improving and being enhanced over time. In addition to the NOLA Public School School Finder, um, the Louisiana Department of Education uh, recently redid their School Finder as well. It is interactive um, and has a lot, I think, more information than what our School Finder tool has right now. Um, the Louisiana site will give you information about um, academic performance by subgroup. It'll, in addition to giving you a letter grade for the school, it gives you progress grades. So how well is the school doing with pushing student scores forward? Um, it'll give you financial data, how much money is spent per pupil, um, teacher-student ratio. Um, so it's also a good resource to, to know about um, as well. Uh, and gives you a lot more different and additional information from the school finder tool that we have. Um, this is the frequently asked questions tab on our website. Um, this is getting really long, so we started to categorize. And as you click the arrows over here, you'll see a drop down of the questions that fit under these different categories. Um, but that's sort of like, what do we get asked the most? Um, and we're constantly adding to this as well. So if you go into it tomorrow, it might look different on Friday. Um, but we are constantly building out our frequently asked questions. And this is the contact us section. Um, can't remember our email address, don't remember the addresses of the family resource centers. Um, you can always just come here, contact us, and you can leave a message and it sends it to, to our enroll at Nova Public Schools address. All right, so when you're ready to apply, you want to go to enrollnolaps.com. You'll go to the enroll tab and you can hit apply now. This is the screen that shows up when you apply now. Um, if the student has never attended a NOLA public school, you would do create a new account um, and that'll walk you through creating an account. This is your parent or guardian portal. So when we use the term parent portal, this is what we're talking about. Um, from there, you would click apply now for the 22-23 school year. This site also, you can see it's in um, Spanish and Vietnamese as well. And then there are four sections that you would complete. Um, if you're applying for kindergarten, you wouldn't need to complete the early childhood section. So you would have A, B, and D. This is apply for next school year. Um, you would add the missing child. So if you were new, you would click this and then this would pop in for you after you add the student information. Um, to do that, you would fill this out for the student and it would create the new student for you. That takes you to section B. Um, you would work on this drop dropdown. Uh, these choices over here are in this drop down, So you would go ahead and click the choice that you're looking for that best describes the enrollment. And then you would click next. Um, from there, it's the early childhood section. Again, if you're applying for a K-12 seat, you would skip this section C and you wouldn't need to do that. Um, if you were looking for an early childhood seat, it just asks some preliminary eligibility questions for, for what type of seat you'd be eligible for. And then you would get to section D, which is your school choices. This is where you rank your school choices. Um, if you're looking at early childhood, you get to rank up to eight schools. And for K-12, you would rank uh, up to 12 schools. Um, the advantage to ranking uh, the more schools is the ability to match. Um, but you definitely want to make sure you're only ranking the schools that you're interested in attending. Um, if you don't get, if you, if you, let's just say you rank one and you don't get that one, then you don't get an assignment. And your options would be to participate in round two and try again or to participate in the summer enrollment and then pick from the available seats. Um, and this just takes you back again to the steps. Um, you create the family profile, you rank your school, submit your application, and then the match results will come in the end of March. And this is just a reminder of, of the application deadline, January 21st. Um, when you submit your application, you do receive a confirmation email letting you know that we've received your application and it's complete. If you are applying to a school with additional academic or language requirements, 
you'll receive an additional email after the confirmation email with instructions on the additional actions that you need to take um, to meet the eligibility requirements of those schools. And then you'll receive those match results um, by March 31st. And I think that's it. Just have a slide with sort of the resources wrapped up, the links for you to make those easy to find in one place. Um, and then our enroll nullapublicschools.com. And then there's also a phone number for the Family Resource Center. It does go straight to voicemail and then folks uh, do call back from the voicemail. I think that's it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for zipping through that. I think it is helpful for people who are, you know, about to actually do that to kind of see the pages and and um, the screenshots of the pages and see the process. But um, so yeah, quickly, thanks again to JCC and the Parenting Center, but especially tonight to Rebecca and Maggie for for going through and and answering. Somebody said, yes, it's overwhelming. It's supposed to be less overwhelming now. <laughs> um, but once you get the information from Adrian or rewatch all of this uh, on the Parenting Center's Facebook page, maybe it'll be less overwhelming. So thanks again, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. I'm sure I'll see some of you tomorrow and I hope I'll see the rest of you soon. Thanks, Jenny. Thank, thank you. Jenny. Thank you guys. Bye.